Hey there, I'm Jim Cruz, lead pastor of Atmosphere Church. Thank you for listening to our church podcast. Our desire is to lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more about our church, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. I'm praying today's episode will touch your heart and change your life. Yeah, so shout out to all my besties over here. Uh, The middle school is in here this morning. Uh, They are a hoot. They're the best. Um, after service, I dare you to go up and say hi to them. Not be weird, so do it, do it nicely. But uh, they're a good group. They are very nice and funny. So uh, my name is Josiah Cruz. Uh, I am super stoked to be here this morning. Um, my role here at the church, amongst many, um, is that I get to lead our middle school and high schoolers, uh, get to have a part in discipling them, uh, pushing them towards Jesus and what that looks like. Um, I've been doing that now for over three years, which is crazy. Um, Feels like I just started yesterday. Um, But it's been a fun three years. Uh, When I started, uh, we didn't really have a youth group or we didn't really have any students. So we would go have Bible studies in my parents' backyard. And sometimes it'd be like one kid and we'd be like, so, you know, (laughs) how's life? Uh, And then sometimes there'd be more. And so it was a really fun journey of uh, just trying to see what God wanted to do. Um, And fast forward, now we've got uh, kids doing crazy awesome stuff for the Lord on their campus and their life uh, and their families. So it's been really cool to see uh, that. But amongst other roles, um, I also have uh, the pleasure of going to different high school and middle school campuses throughout the week. Um, During our vision sermon a couple weeks ago, uh, we got to talk a little bit about how we're partnered with FCA and Young Life in different organizations. Uh, so we get to go onto campuses uh, and talk to kids in their current context at their school uh, about Jesus, about the Bible, um, and have really cool conversations with kids just about uh, the life they're living. And uh, we get to hand out pizza. It's awesome. It's super amazing part of what I get to do. Uh, just last week, Uh, We have a middle school Bible club at Redwood Middle School. And any Redwood Middle School graduates? No. Awesome. A one. Let's go. Um, Wow, that was awesome. One person. And uh, we get to go there every Thursday. And uh, one kid came up to me after I gave a little talk on Jesus uh, being a miracle worker. And this kid comes up to me and he says, hey, I had a question, and we talked about it, and he said, I've actually never been to church. I've never heard about Jesus. Uh, I've never really done anything like that, but a friend invited me here today, and I thought I would give Jesus a try. And I said, hey, make me a promise that after, like, you stay for a semester, come back every Thursday, learn more about Jesus, learn more about who he is, ask questions. And I said, if at the end of next semester, you want to say, no, thank you, that's fine, but at least give him a chance. And he said, okay, I'll do that. And so uh, he made a commitment to come back next week, but we were, we're having Thanksgiving next week, so he won't be there next week. Um, but the week after that, he'll be there. And so I'm really excited just about what God's doing in kids that Man, they go to school in the morning, totally not expecting or thinking about Jesus at all, but then they go home trying to comprehend what God is uh, doing in the universe, what God might be trying to do in their life. It's amazing. Uh, People talk a lot about the next generation, kind of like they don't care, they're disinterested, but I think they're more interested than any generation I've seen. Uh, So be praying, be praying for your schools and teachers. Uh, We have amazing youth leaders that are sitting over there with our kids right now. Um, They are the best people in the world. They give up their time, their resources so that they can pour into these kids. And so uh, be praying for them as well because they are the front lines. Um, But part of what I get to do is really awesome is uh, have these conversations with students uh, kind of just where they're at. Um, this last, or a couple of years ago, probably now, we had a student that was, uh, it was newer to church, hadn't really given Jesus a lot of thought. And uh, I kind of knew that going into the trip to, to Hume Lake. And so at the end of the week, I asked the student, I said, hey, what do you think? Like, you're hearing a lot about Jesus. You're hearing a lot about the gospel. What is your thoughts behind that? And the student said, you know, worship's really great. The teaching's great. Um, You know, I I love what the speaker had to say. And I was kind of waiting for that, like, and, you know, and come on, what else? And they said, "I listen, I love it. But, like, I think I love this lifestyle that I live at home. 
Uh, I think, uh, you know, I love to party and I love my friends and my friends like to party. And so I kind of am, you know, wanting to live that life. And it was a really hard conversation. Those are some of the hard moments that we encounter where, man, you really want it for a student and, and maybe the timing's just not yet. But what I did really appreciate about that conversation is this student in particular saw that there was a difference between the lifestyle that they were living and the lifestyle that Jesus has called us to live. They saw the difference in those two. And I appreciated that because I think what's happening now in our culture, not just in students, not just in middle schoolers and high schoolers, but also in all of Christian communities around America in particular, is we're seeing this divide where now people have this, yes, I like to party or I like to give myself over to money or whatever it may be. I like to idolize this thing. But I really like the ideas of grace and mercy and forgiveness. I like what Jesus has to say. And so rather saying, I want this life instead of this life, they mesh the two together. And now we have a group of Christians that say they are all in for Jesus, but live a life that looks nothing like his disciples looked like. And that's a problem. That's a really big problem because if the world is supposed to see us by our fruit, by the way that we love, by the way that we live for Jesus, if we are the image bearers of Christ, but yet we look nothing different than the world, we look just like everyone else, there is a problem because as we go and live life, people are not going to separate. This is what Jesus is all about and this is what the world is all about. They're going to see them together. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to look at what did Jesus say about living a lifestyle that is for the kingdom? What did, what did Jesus have to say about living his way of life, being a disciple of him? What does that look like? Because again, if our church does not look any different than the guys and girls who are going to the clubs, who are living really terrible lives, then we cannot expect people to want anything that Jesus has to offer because it's nothing different than what they're experiencing. And this is something we've encountered with our students. This, uh, earlier this year, we went through a series called uh, Thy Kingdom Come. And what we were doing is we walked through the Sermon on the Mount. And what we were trying to look at was, hey, Jesus gave this sermon to people, and he's trying to explain to them what a disciple of his should really look like. He's trying to get people to see that a follower of Jesus should live a certain life, not because it's just doing more, but because, hey, when your life is built on Jesus, this is the response. And so in a culture that is constantly telling our kids and, and our people like, hey, you can do this and, and fit in this way and, and look cool doing this, we want to make sure that our students know, no, being a Christian looks different than the rest of the world. And I don't think that message has to change for adults. I think that we need to hear this message over and over again, that you should not look like the rest of the world, not because you want to look better or because you want to appear better, but because as a Christian, you are called to a different set of standards. You're called to a different way of life. And so this morning, we're going to look at Jesus's words on that. Really quick shout out, because uh, I said I was going to do this earlier, but I didn't. Uh, one of our students started a Bible club this semester on his own, and he's, he is here. So Reed, can you stand up really quick? Reed is over here. Reed started his own Bible club. And I said, I said, can I shout you out? He said, no. And I said, I'm going to do it anyway. So just know that we have some studs in our middle school group that are doing great things. But uh, we're going to dive into the text, so we're going to pray. So would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. Um, God, we just ask that you'd speak to us. Holy Spirit, have your way. Open our hearts and our minds to receive. God, it is not my words. It is not our thoughts. Jesus, your words reign above all else. And so we just ask that today your words would seep into our hearts would it produce change in our life? Would it produce change in the way that we think? God, we're not here for just another 30-minute message that we can go home. Lord, we want to encounter the living God, and we know you're here. So God, would you just meet us here this morning? Teach us more of how we can glorify you and magnify you in our daily life. We love you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. So, the text we're going to be in is in Matthew chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, uh, verses 24 through 29. It says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he had taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So in this, Jesus is giving us the end of his sermon. The way that Jesus concludes his sermon, this is literally the ending, the cherry on top. He ends with the wise and the foolish builder. Uh, There's a a guy who wrote a book uh, in the 80s. His name is Neil Postman. And he wrote this book trying to tackle this idea that the television uh, is actually a bad thing for the human brain. Right? If only this guy had an idea of what our smartphones would do to us, right? He'd probably write another book. But he's saying that the TV is bad for our brains because it's giving us so much information that we don't know what to do with it. That it's causing our brain to get used to this idea of hearing things and not really knowing how to respond. And so he says this quote in this book. I thought it was so good. How often does it occur that information provided you on morning radio or television or in the morning newspaper causes you to alter your plans for the day or to take some action you would not have otherwise taken or provides insight into some problem you're required to solve? For most of us, news of the weather will sometimes have consequences for investors, news of the stock market. Perhaps an occasional story about crime will do it if by chance it occurred near where you lived or or involved someone you know. Next slide. (laughs) There it is. But most of our daily news is inert, consisting of information that gives us something to talk about, but cannot lead to any meaningful action. You may get a sense of what this means by asking yourself another series of questions. What steps do you plan to take to reduce the conflict in the Middle East or the rates of inflation, crime, and unemployment? What are your plans for preserving the environment or reducing risk of nuclear war? What plan do you have about NATO, OPEC, or CIA or affirmative action? I shall take the liberty of answering for you. You plan to do nothing about them. You may, of course, cast a ballot for someone who claims to have some plans as well as some power to act, but this you can only do every two to four years by giving one hour of your time, hardly a satisfying means of expressing your broad range of opinions you hold. So what is he saying? He's saying you are getting so much info downloaded into your brain that you cannot respond to. Right? You hear something on the news that touches you, and you're like, man, that's crazy. There's war breaking out all over the world, it seems. There's inflation rates. It's getting super high. It's hard to buy a house. You're hearing all of these things, but because there's so much information constantly being put in your brain, your brain is getting used to the idea of hearing things and not doing anything about them. Why? Because some of them you just can't. Right? If there's war in the Middle East or Ukraine, you're not going to go and fight that battle, most of us. If you hear about inflation, you alone as a person cannot change the rates of inflation. And so the problem is, is that through social media, through all the stuff that we're doing or intaking into our, our minds, we're getting used to this like, ah, I'm not going to do anything about it because I can't. Later in that book, he talks about this idea of this information to action ratio. It's like comparing how much info to how much action you're taking based on that info. And he said it just keeps getting lower and lower and lower and lower. And mind you, this was in the 80s, and it was really low. So where are we at now? Oh, my gosh, probably like zero, right? We're hearing all this stuff, and we're not responding. My fear, and what I've seen not only in my life or in students' lives, but in many adults' lives is that Jesus' words that he gives, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, are so compelling, are so inspiring, are so like jaw-dropping. But maybe for some of us, that's the extent as far as it goes, where we hear the things he's saying, we're inspired or touched by the things that he's saying, but the change that comes in our life, the surrendering of our ideals to his, doesn't follow. Uh, This warning that Jesus gives, uh, a lot of biblical commentators call these the warnings because Jesus ends his sermon with trying to separate. There's false Christians and there's real ones. Some of you guys get uncomfortable by talking about that, but hey, that's the reality, that there are people who will claim Christianity and care nothing about Jesus. And so we as Christians have that ability through the Holy Spirit to have that discernment, but guess what? I don't think Jesus is saying this for you to just look at other people. I think Jesus is giving this message so you can look in the mirror and say, wait, where's my heart at? 
We have tendency as humans to hear sermons or hear something and go, who do, like, what friend of my contacts do I need to send this to? What friend is kind of living in this sin or this thing that needs to hear this? It's terrible. Like some, last week I heard a sermon and I was like, oh, they need to hear this bad. And then I was like, what does that mean about me, right? Like the first thought isn't like, how can I grow? And so the first uh, of four warnings that Jesus gives at the end of his sermon, the first one he gives is the wide and narrow gate where Jesus says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate that leads to life. Few will enter the narrow gate, many will enter the wide gate. The second one he gives is true and false prophets. Hey, false prophets will try to disguise themselves in sheep's clothing. And so you'll tell a a good tree by its fruit that it bears. Then you have true and false disciples. Hey, there's going to be some that say, Lord, Lord, did I not do all these things in your name? And he says, hey, away away from me, evildoer. I never knew you. And then the last one is a wise and foolish builder, those who hear what he's saying and do not put them into practice versus those who do hear what he's saying and do put them into practice. And so Jesus ends his sermon kind of in a chilling fashion. Uh, I worked at Hume for uh, a summer. And at Hume Lake, there's this formula that every camp speaker will end their message with. And it's you talk about sin. You talk about the weight of what that does uh, to your life, disobedience to God. You then talk about the cross. Um, Jesus died on the cross for your sin. And that obviously is the atonement and all those things. And then the week ends with go. You've been transformed. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go be an image bearer for Christ. And there's a reason this formula works and is repeatedly done throughout summer by summer. It's because it's a good message. It's the gospel message. But Jesus' way that he ends this sermon is not in that fashion. It's not an inspiring, hey, go be a life changer. Go be this awesome person. Jesus ends it with warnings. Uh, There's this word in the Greek, uh, poieto, and it means to do or to act or to obey on or to put into practice. And it's used 22 times in the Sermon on the Mount, but it's used 10 times in the last four warnings that we just read. Three chapters, 22 times, Jesus is saying, hey, obey, 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 practice, 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 act on this, act on this, act on this. Why? Because Jesus had a high emphasis on those who follow me will live life in such a fashion that their life will reflect that they follow me, that if they really truly love me, their life will be a reflection of of how I've called them to live. The Sermon on the Mount goes through three chapters of Jesus saying, hey, this is how you should view adultery. This is how you should view judgment. This is how you should view worry. Jesus is trying to get us, his followers, to see this is, as a disciple of Jesus, the life that I should be living. But, but the issue is, is that we are hearing those things. But the question is, are we practicing? Are we acting on those things? Are we obeying those things? Which leads us to this story where Jesus compares the wise and the foolish builder. And it's really interesting. Uh, In verse 24, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And so Jesus commends those who hear his words and they practice them. They actually go out and do them. Um, Dale Bruner is a biblical commentator, and he's a really smart guy. If you haven't heard about him, look him up. He's great. But what he does that I love is he reminds us that this house, right, that is built on rock, it does not say that the house is going to, like, magically not face any of the storm, that it's going to turn into a mansion, or that, like, the cabinets won't get some water damage, or the carpet might get some water damage, or the furniture might be rearranged, Dale Brunner says, no, actually, like the house is going to face the storm, just like the house that is built on the sand. They both face a storm. But this is the beauty of what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, follow me, and nothing will come to your life. Nothing bad will happen to you. Every trial you have won't hit you. No, Jesus says, hey, you build your house on the rock. It's not that your house is going to become a mansion, but that it's going to stay up. And friends, the most beautiful thing about following Jesus, is that in the midst of trial, in the midst of all the things around us, in the midst of chaos, Jesus says, in me, when your house is built on me and the way of life that I've given you, your house will not fall. He says this, this quote from Dale Brunner, obedience to Jesus's words is not so much protection from troubles as protection in them, just as a rock under a house does not shield from storms, but supports during them. 
following Jesus does not mean your life's going to be easy, but following Jesus means that he will withstand everything. You'll be able to stay up. Man, when your family goes awry, when you get that call that, that changes your life, whatever it may be, finances, Jesus says, as a follower of me, those things will hurt, but they will not destroy you. But then he contrasts that with a different kind of person. Uh, the word here in the Greek can also be translated into moros, and it goes into moron, right? Where we get the word moron. So it could be like the smarty and the moron, right? It's like another translation for it. And so he talks about this foolish builder that, man, he heard what Jesus was saying, but instead of practicing, putting into play these things, these teachings that Jesus gave, they didn't. And so in verse 26, it says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. It's important to note here that Jesus isn't addressing like non-Christians and Christians, that Jesus says both these people are hearing the same things. You come here every Sunday, you hear a message. You came last Sunday, you heard a message. You're hearing the same things. But the difference Jesus makes is there are some who will act on it and there are some who will not. And that's important. That's really important. Jesus makes this distinction that the foolish builder finds Jesus' words important enough to listen, important enough to hear, but not important enough to act on. And some of you guys may be in here today, you're like, Jesus' words are inspiring. They're, they're, they're just like jaw-dropping. They're awesome. His ideas, his ways of life are great. But I'm here to remind you that to be inspired by Jesus does not mean that you are truly walking with Jesus. There are many in life who will see Jesus' way of life and be like, that's sick. But then Jesus is like, all right, now go and like live this life that I've designed you to live. And they're like, no, thank you. Just like the student I said at the beginning, she saw Jesus's life and she saw her life and she said, I think I want this one. But we cannot live in a world where somehow we, we live our own life and we adopt Jesus's grace and forgiveness. Those things do not go hand in hand. God designed us to be fully in for him. And so the number one excuse that we always run back to when um, we aren't living in the way of Jesus or we aren't submitting to Jesus' teachings and lifestyle is we go back to like, well, Jesus didn't have as many jobs as me. Jesus didn't have to run the company like I do. Jesus didn't have the family I had. And we relate back to all these modern lifestyle issues of pace and the way of life. But man, my question is, is do you think that that is a valid excuse to one day go before the throne and, and say, well, Jesus, I was busy. Or Jesus, I didn't have time. Or Jesus, I, I, I know you wanted me to live this kind of lifestyle, but like, I, I just, I, I thought this was better. The, the thing that Jesus wanted to end his sermon with was, hey, you've got to wake up. You've got to be aware of the fact that there are going to be people who think they are with me, but they know nothing about me. And man, I, I really don't, especially for those students over there, I do not want a generation that thinks I'm a Christian, but they live nothing like the way that Jesus designed them to live. And the same thing goes for adults. I don't want to know Christian adults that say, yes, I'm a Christian, I love God, Philippians 4.13, and then go out and live the same life they lived before they met Christ. I always tell our students, the day you received and accepted Christ in your life, in 10 years, you will look different because God's goal is to transform you, not to inform you. God does not want you to just have information and, and to leave it at that or intellectual assent. God doesn't want you to know the Greek and Hebrew so that you can just observe him. God wants your life to actually resemble what he's designed you to live like. And this is why he takes a sermon on a mountain, thus the Sermon on the Mount, to tell his people, hey, this is everything that you need to know. This is how you should view this problem. This is how you should act in this way. And he's not doing that to be like a police and like, hey, are you living the right way? Are you, are you doing the right works? No, Jesus is saying, if you want to live for me, then this is the ideas that you submit to. This is the way of life that your daily life should reflect. And I think the problem we have is, is daily life is a hard thing, no? Sundays might be easier, or you have a life group, it might be easier. But daily life means like at work. 
Daily life means with your family at Thanksgiving that you just cannot stand, right? That's where you're supposed to live and practice out the way of Jesus in all things. And so this story is intriguing because uh, from a distance, these two houses look the same, right? Uh, has anyone, I did this first service and it really flopped. Has anyone ever watched uh, Cake or Steak? Okay, one. Okay, we've got more. First service, they were like, what is this guy doing right now? The youth guy, classic. No, cake or steak is like this Instagram reels thing where they cut into what looks like a piece of cake and then it's like a steak. Or they cut into a steak and it's actually a piece of cake. You're like, what is going on right now? But here's the thing. There's a point where I'm going, going with this. It's you don't know what it is until they cut it open. Like once you cut that thing open, it's like, oh, that's a steak. Or, oh, that steak is actually a cake, right? It's, it sounds really boring. But once they cut that thing open, you know in that moment, that's what that is. When you look at these houses from a distance, the wise and the foolish builder, you don't know what's what because it's, it's foundation. It's not like stuff you see. It's not the walls. It's not the roof. Jesus says you'll know its foundation when, when the storm comes. You cannot tell someone's foundation from a distance, and so I think there's two things that we have to do with that. Number one, I'm not designed to just look at people's houses and make a guess. Oh, what are they doing? How are they living their life? I'm not supposed to have that inference of like, I think they're this and that. You can tell a tree by its fruit for sure. But we aren't called to just like judge people and live our lives surrounded looking at them. Because here's the other important part about that. I said this earlier. We've got to learn to look in the mirror and take inventory of our own self. If we spend our whole life focused on everyone else, I am confident we'll get before the throne and Jesus is going to go like, man, I wanted to do so much with you. But instead of you wanting to do stuff with me, with you, you were too focused on other people. Jesus wants to live a radical life with you. And so walking away from today, my hope isn't that you're texting your friends going, you need to hear this, you need to hear this. Maybe they do. But man, I hope that you walk away from today being like, am I genuinely submitted to the life that Jesus called me to live? I am a disciple of Jesus. That's what I claim. Do I submit to all of these things that he says in his sermon, in his walk, in his way of life? Because we cannot keep carrying around this title and live a life that looks nothing like our king. We can't do it, and me included. I know I sound passionate, but man, it's because I did this. I lived this way for a long time. And so I know what it's like to live in that space where you're like, yes, I love God and it's awesome, but you don't do anything in your life to actually try to pursue him. It's easy to be intellectually excited or enlightened by what God has to say, but it's hard to actually live out a life that he's called you to live. Why? Because it's completely opposite of what the world tells you. It's completely opposite of how your job tells you to live your life, how social media tells you to live your life. The reason that it feels hard is because it's not the norm. And Jesus was stoked about that. Because when it's not the norm, people will see a difference. Again, just like that student, she saw there's a difference in these two lifestyles. I really hope that all of us in here can see, man, maybe my life's not reflecting this lifestyle. Maybe my life is not in step with what Jesus has called me to do. I, uh, I think a lot of times when we talk about this, what can happen is we get stuck. I was just talking to Dylan about this. We can get stuck in this like workspace argument of like, well, isn't this kind of like telling me to just do more stuff? But the reality is not that Jesus wants you to just do more stuff. The Sermon on the Mount was not so that you could just look good or feel good about yourself. Jesus was giving us those things on the Sermon on the Mount because he wanted us to live a life that would be life to the full. What do I mean by that? When Jesus says, do not worry, he's not saying that so you can just be like, all right, I'm going to guess I'm not going to worry anymore. No, he's like, hey, I want you to experience what it's like not to worry. When Jesus says, hey, don't look at that man or woman with lustful thoughts in your mind because that's adultery. He's not trying to condemn you. He's trying to say, hey, a life without having to deal with those lustful thoughts is a good life. All of these teachings is not to condemn us, but to invite us into a really awesome lifestyle that frees you from this bondage of all these sins, all these sinful thoughts and desires. And I experienced that for a long time where I grew up in church and I was like, man, why is God so concerned with what I'm doing and not doing? And I didn't get it because now that I've walked with Jesus for some time, I see, man, he's freed me from a lot of stuff that I had to deal with for a long time. I don't have to walk in that anymore, that pain. 
that conviction or that shame of like, man, I just can't free myself from this stuff. I promise you, those of you in here, maybe you're new to a relationship with God or maybe you're considering it. I promise you that once you engage in a relationship with Jesus, you give your life to him, he will transform you. And in five years, you will look so different than you do today. That's the promise that he gives us. He's not looking to inform us, but to transform us. And so I want to bring it all back to this. I had a conversation with this student after this very sermon a few, like earlier this year. And he came up to me and he said, Josiah, I feel like this is a harsh way to end a series. And I said, well, I have two things to that. I said, first of all, this is how Jesus ended his. So I said, you got to take it up with him. (laughs) But I said, second of all, let's talk about that. And we talked about it for a while. And at the end of it, I kind of gathered what was going on. I said, hey, are you afraid? Does this bring fear to you? And he said, yes, it does. It brings fear to me. I read those warnings. I read what Jesus is saying about the true and false disciple, about the wise and foolish builder. And I don't know if I stand in those right categories. I don't know that I am the guy that hears and does. I don't know that I am the one that I'll go before the Lord and he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I said, hey, this fear that you're feeling, I don't think it's a bad thing. Because I said, this is God inviting you into this. This is not God saying it's over. This is God showing you, hey, Maybe your life's not where it's supposed to be, and and it's an invitation. And so if you feel this pressing, like, I don't think I'm there, that's not God trying to make you feel bad. That's God inviting you in. And as I was preparing for this sermon and praying, I was like, Lord, I, I, I really don't want anyone to walk away feeling less than. And he just reminded me, Josiah, you don't have to worry about that. This is my words, not yours. And so when you read the Sermon on the Mount, I'm just drawn in by the the teachings he has. It's so against what the world is saying. And I'm not 100%. No one is 100% achieving those things every day. That's why the word that Jesus decided to use was, hey, put into practice. The beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, it's book ended with this idea of the word practice. Where he's saying, practice these things. By the help of the Holy Spirit, he allows me to walk forward. I mess up. God says, let's go, let's keep going. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's the beauty of what God's doing in our life. Transformation is not overnight. And I'm so glad it's not because till I die, every day is a new opportunity for me to walk more in step with what he's designed me to do, more in step with who he's aligned me to be. And that's what all of us are invited into. And so as we close, I just want to remind you guys that knowing God just knowing what you're supposed to live like, knowing what discipleship looks like is not enough. That God invites you into discipleship not so that you can know what it is, so that you can do it. And, and again, this is not to make you feel bad if you're not, but it's like, hey, it's an invitation. Walking in discipleship is the best thing I ever have done. It's the most fun thing I do. I wake up every morning, my dad always says it, but it's this idea of like, hey, God, have fun with me today. It's so exciting getting to every day experience something new with my King and my Savior. And so I always try to have a goal when we leave middle school or high school. I always want to have a goal of like, what's the point here? What are we walking away with? And I always like to give homework. And your homework is that I want you to go home. I want you to, maybe you go to lunch or whatever. I want you to have some solo time today. And for you to sit and talk with the Lord, have prayer time and ask the Lord, Lord, is there any part of me that's not surrendered to this? Is there any part of me that maybe I haven't noticed that I'm not really surrendered to your idea, your way of life? Is there any part of me that maybe doesn't submit to the idea of how you handle lust and adultery or how you handle judgment or how you handle worry? Is there any part of me that's trying to control it myself? Because the last thing we wanna do as followers of Jesus is try to be in control. If we really truly are going to live by what we believe, then we believe that he is authoring and ordering our steps, that he's the one we want driving the car. And so maybe you're, you're just someone that kind of took the keys. He, he made a turn you didn't like and you took the keys and said, I'm driving. So maybe today's just a reminder to yourself of like, I'm not driving. I am not capable of driving this car. You need Jesus back in, in the driver's seat. And so today as we close and we have a response song, after the response song, we'll have a chance to pray with uh, one of our prayer team people. I know you call them. Prayer, prayer fights? I don't know. Um, if you want to pray with them after worship, please, please, please invite someone in to the mess that you're going through. 
Invite someone in. We got prayer warriors up here, man, that they literally love to join with you in your struggle and bring it to God. Because if we really believe in Jesus' way, we believe that he will meet us in our mess. If we build our house on his rock, our house will not fall. And so rather than wait for the storm to come, maybe this morning's a chance to just realign where we built our house. Uh, Would you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. God, so grateful that you allow us to enter into life with you. God, that I get to wake up and I get to just experience life with you. That's crazy. I don't deserve that. Lord, nobody in here deserves that. But you love us so much that you would want to engage in relationship with us. That's something I will never fully comprehend, Lord. You're so good. And so, Lord, I pray for anyone in here this morning that maybe just feels like their life is kind of drifting from you. They've maybe drifted from the way of life that you want them to be living in, not for rules, not for do's and don'ts, but for their good. Lord, I just pray that you draw them back into your presence today. Give them the trust to just hand the keys over and say, you're in charge. Lord, we love you. We're grateful for what you're doing in all of our lives. God, just pray that you would continue to meet us in our mess. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Thank you for tuning in today to another great episode from Atmosphere Church. If this message has spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe buttons. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be part of one of our in-person gatherings. For more information about our church, go to our official website at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this episode and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not just these things, but to also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.